as I boldly soar to heaven beyond the clouds. With Jove I taste ambrosia divine, and search the sevenfold heaven's ceaseless orbs among the stars, wandering well-known paths. The stars that reveal the skill of godly will, that built a sparkling roof above the earth, the stars that far in advance know our fate. Fate, often good, often bad. The stars that silently exercise justice among you. Much do they grant with grace. They hinder too, but do not force the soul that has a mind. For he does all according to his will. But few will take the way of the mind on earth. So very few can bend the heavenly force. These words, part of an elegy to Urania, were written by Tycho Brahe as part of his announcement of what would prove to be his single greatest observational discovery. However, the journey to that point would be an unconventional one that would eventually lead to exile and death. In this episode, we'll take the first steps along that grand and ultimately tragic path that brought fame, scandal, and heartbreak to the greatest observational astronomer Europe had ever known. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 15.1, Supplemental. The Rise of Tycho Brahe. As we spend some time this week looking at a biographical sketch of Tycho Brahe, I'd like to make a few introductory comments about what I hope to do in this and the following episode. Last time, we delved into his scientific work, but I think there's always something sort of lost in those kinds of treatments. When you read the usual descriptions of the transition from a geliocentric cosmology to a heliocentric one, Brahe's work is always mentioned but often it's just only kind of in passing. Many authors treat his Tychonic model as a step backwards in some kind of linear process rather than the revolutionary step I think it was. That's at least my opinion anyway. I see it as a step sideways into uncharted territory first glimpsed in the path of the comet of 1577. In the typical discussions, Tycho is something of a placeholder until Kepler comes along, rather than not only being the best observational astronomer of at least a generation, if not all of post paleo European astronomical tradition, but he's also a highly creative and innovative thinker willing to jettison centuries, if not millennia, of astronomical tradition in doing away with the crystalline spheres that had held up the heavens for so long. If one reads the more academic works on Brahe, a very different picture emerges of the man. It's much more nuanced and complex. Tycho, in his life and his work, represents not only new ideas, but also the development of new models for doing science in an evolving social landscape of patronage and national identity. His work, first at Herevad and then on Venn, and later in Germany and then Prague, is made possible by the resources gathered by more centralized power structures, even as, even as it is affected by the growing friction between the various factions of Christianity, something that would explode into violence during Kepler's time of working with the data Tycho left behind. What I'd like to do with these next two episodes is use Tycho's journey 
to highlight these changes and see what can be learned from them. The first thing I'd like to point out is that in our story, a subtle but important shift has taken place in who is doing astronomy. Up through the 15th century, and even into the 16th century, the bulk of natural philosophy and astronomy was being done in the scholastic universities. By the middle of the 16th century, however, that had begun to shift, at least in the field of astronomy. There are a lot of reasons for this, but let me focus on a few. One reason had to do with the growing rigidity of the scholastic movement with its adherence to the synthesis of Aristotle and Augustine first created in the 13th century by Thomas Aquinas. One of the hallmarks of science, I think, is its ability to adapt to solve new problems or puzzles. This is one of the modern criteria some philosophers of science will use to distinguish things that are science from those that claim to be but that are not. While the argument that the heliocentric model was created by Copernicus to deal with increasingly bad predictions made by the Ptolemaic system has been shown to be wrong, there is very much the sense that one of the driving forces of the model's creation was the desire to solve the problem of non-uniform planetary motion without having to resort to the old and disliked equant. It seems clear that many in the universities were, by this point, becoming increasingly hostile to new ideas or ways of looking at things. It was also clear that by this point, no matter how hard the various mathematicians and natural philosophers of the great universities tried, they couldn't make Ptolemy work yet it was still taught as the only official model of the creation or of the solar system. Even as the work of Copernicus became better known, those who felt it offered a better way forward were compelled by the received knowledge of scholasticism and the administrators who were steeped in it to continue to teach geocentrism as the only correct model. Reticus, for example, regularly chafed under the requirement that he primarily teach an old idea that was clearly not moving forward in solving problems. Even after his banishment from Leipzig, when he was offered a position at Paris, he chose to work outside of an academic structure, in part because of the resistance to new ideas he felt ensconced in such places. Michael Maislin, Tycho's colleague at Turbigen, was expected to hold and teach Ptolemy's model as correct a task he found difficult and subverted whenever possible due to his view that Copernicus's model was actually the correct one. Another reason for the shift was the rise of the Renaissance outside of Italy and the disruptive effects it had on the political and social structures long in place but that had been undermined by the depopulation due to the continuing effects of the Great Mortality. As feudalism unraveled, there arose a group of stronger national leaders who more directly took the reins of government. In some places, such as Germany, this would give rise to a fractured group of powerful individuals who jostled for control and influence, while in others, there would be a concentration of power, first in an aristocracy, and then, in time, under the control of a single enlightened despot or autocrat, as was the case in France, Russia, and Denmark, as we will discuss. These powerful individuals sought to understand and use the forces, both military, political, and economic, that brought about the rise and fall of political entities, and as such, they became deeply interested, and in some cases, highly motivated by, in and by astrology. This led to the courts of the powerful requiring the services of those who could cast and interpret horoscopes, i.e. astrologers. With that came additional support for observation and research. Given this new set of opportunities, it is hardly surprising that many of the individuals who might have otherwise found employment as mathematicians and astronomers in the scholastic universities found it both more lucrative and productive to serve the rich and powerful by casting horoscopes while conducting investigations that promised to improve their predictions. No figure better embodies this than Tycho Brahe, who would, for most of his professional life, be supported by a combination of noble patronage and astrological divination. Finally, as the military structure of many of the political entities began to change with the expiration of feudalism, more members of the noble class were freed to pursue interests once outside the traditional purview of their class. This was amplified by the growing wealth and influence of a middle class who could now afford an education for their children once only made available to the younger sons of those very wealthy. 
Here again, we see these changes clearly in the life of Tycho. Before this time, it would have been almost inconceivable that Tycho would have done anything other than served on Denmark's Privy Council and garrisoned the country's frontier. So then, this is a good jumping off point for our look at the life of Tycho. When he was born, Tiga Brahe Altesen, on November 14, 1546, his family had served the kings of Denmark for generations on both his mother's and father's sides. With histories filled with the ebbs and flows so often associated with powerful families, the Brahes of Newt Storpsburg, his father's family, and the Billies, a family with deep ecclesiastical connections on his mother's side, they were both fundamentally a part of the aristocratic class that had run the Dane March for centuries. As the more local lord and manor system of feudal times was disrupted, these aristocratic families worked with the royal dynasty to centralize the administration of a powerful northern European kingdom. While the king was the law in Denmark, throughout the 16th century, he ruled at the consent of these aristocratic families whose job it was to protect and administer the kingdom. If the three estates of pre-revolutionary France are to be applied here, Tycho's parents, and thus the boy himself, belonged to the noble class that fought, was connected with those who prayed, and thus was supported by those who worked. However, unlike the situation in France two centuries later, there was no upward class mobility in Denmark, as we shall see. For example, one couldn't buy noble privileges or high offices, as would be the case in many countries in later European times. One rose to power through service to the other great families of the realm, services repaid in kind over generations to create ties that were not easily broken. As an example, Tycho's great uncle, a man called Axel, had been among the first in Denmark to embrace the Reformation. His support of the Lutheran king, Christian III, vaulted the Brahe family into the innermost circles of power and influence and resulted in the granting of strategic fiefdoms and fortress keeps that were held in readiness should the king need men at arms in time of war. By the way, if this all seems very Game of Thrones, well, every friction has to have its source material, right? For young sons of these noble families, it was common that after a time of childhood with their parents, they would be handed over to the care of a relative who, lacking the usual emotional attachments to the child, could make the sorts of decisions thought necessary to raise him or her for the roles required by an often harsh and uncompromising world. This system also strengthened the bonds of obligation between families and lowered the chance that various branches of a family would go to war with one another over land claims and the like, something that would invariably weaken the kingdom at large. What was odd was that in Tycho's case, the age and circumstances of his quote-unquote fostering were really very different. At the tender age of two, he was basically kidnapped from his parents' homes by an uncle for reasons that remain unclear. Perhaps there was the threat of strife, or maybe it was just that the couple had no children of their own. But whatever the reason, Tycho would be raised from his earliest memory by his father's brother, Jorgen, and his wife, Inger Ox. Now, the Oxes were an old aristocratic family as well, and they were as influential and well-placed as the Brahes. But in them was something a bit different. They had in them, instead of just that typical warrior class mentality, there was a love of learning and culture. Inger's brother, Petter, was a gifted scholar and diplomat, and he was actually the steward of the realm. And Inger, equally charming and graceful and intelligent, counted among her correspondents and closest friends the sister of the king, Frederick II. Now, it's hard to say what the impact of having two families was on Tycho, but it may be that the kidnapping, because that's really what it was, and the subsequent acquiescence to it by his birth parents just a little bit loosened the ties of family in the young boy's mind. Moreover, it seems clear that the influence of both Petter and Inger Ox created within his worldview a more unorthodox perspective, at least for a member of the venerable Danish warrior family, such as the Brahes. And we'll return to this theme fairly soon. As a child, Tycho would have traveled around Denmark extensively, and when he was about six, his foster father was given command of a castle stronghold on the main route from the European continent to Copenhagen, known as Vordingborg. 
Any great political figure traveling north would have had to stop there, and so the young boy would have been present for visits of the Duke of Mecklenburg and Princess Anne of Saxony and their enormous retinues of knights and courtiers. The King of Denmark himself would have stayed at the fortress not infrequently, along with his sons, and so Tycho would have been no stranger to the company and formality of high court life. It was, to use the phrase, the water in which he swam. At age seven, he would have started his formal schooling, learning Latin at his uncle's insistence over the objections of his father, along with elementary mathematics and religion. In this schooling, he would likely have stayed in the home of a clergyman, a middle-class Lutheran trained in Wittenberg, whose household emulated those of Luther and Melanchthon. Here again, he would have experienced something a bit different than his father's generation. Relationships outside of his social class and conversations focused on concerns outside of the affairs of state. At age 12, in 1559, he went to Copenhagen to attend the university there, and may have earned a degree, something pretty unusual for a nobleman's son, for whom that degree conferred no additional status, and thus was thought, usually anyway, to be an unnecessary formality for one whose purpose at the institution was to learn the various skills and knowledge needed to assist in the work of administering fiefs. Copenhagen was an excellent school that had been generously endowed first by Christian III and then by his son, Frederick II. The university's curriculum was formed on the basis of Melanchthon's humanist ideals and thus consisted of a broad array of the liberal arts, including mathematics and astronomy. In August of 1560, there was a lunar eclipse that seems to have fully captured Tycho's imagination, increasing an already healthy interest in the subject of astronomy. A good way to think about this might be to compare it to children nowadays. When you think about middle school kids, and some of you probably have middle school kids, and then you think about science, there's almost always something that middle school kid really gets into. Maybe it's dinosaurs, maybe it's insects, maybe it's meteorology, but a lot of the time it's astronomy and the night sky. Now let's imagine that you have a child who's, say, into dinosaurs, and you send him or her to science camp at your local college and university. And while out on some sort of field trip, they find a relatively intact set of fossil remains of some species of dinosaur. It's, say, not that exotic for those who practice in the field of paleontology, but it's still a pretty nice find. Now what do you think the chances are that our intellectually curious and seriously gifted budding scientists will head towards a career not just in science, but also in something having to do with dinosaurs? What Tycho experiences with the lunar eclipse is probably an awful lot like this. The faculty at Copenhagen would likely have been buzzing about the possibility of the eclipse as the date approached, and would have gathered on the possible dates of its occurrence as predicted by either the Alphonsan or Prutenic tables. Students would have been encouraged to join in, even those in the very early stages of their education. What would also have made an impression on the young man was the fact that the viewing party would have gathered twice, as it turned out that the predictions were actually off by a day. Again, one can imagine the 13-year-old boy asking rather imperiously of his elders, why didn't the tables do a better job of predicting the obvious an event? I mean, it's just right there, isn't it? Unfortunately, Tycho wasn't at the university to study the heavens as a vocation. He was at university to learn how to handle the affairs of state. In 1561, possibly after having earned that degree, Tycho's education entered a new phase. Aristocratic sons of Denmark's great families were expected to form something of a more international social network and get a broader sense of the world in which their affairs would take place. As such, they would be sent on a tour of the important cities and places of at least Germany, if not greater Europe. Now, for some, this would involve visiting and interacting with the various noble courts appropriate to their station through an older path, something that went, you know, you started out as a page, and then you would become a squire in a different court, and then you would become a knight, etc., etc. For Tycho, though, whose life was influenced by the values of the learned Ox family, this meant visits to cities that had both noble courts and esteemed universities where the young man could continue his studies. So, in this vein, it was that Tycho was first sent to Leipzig in Saxony under the supervision of a preceptor by the name of Anders Sorensen Videl. Videl, four years older than Tycho, 
and from a respectable middle-class family, had the job of serving as Brahe's companion, chaperone, tutor, and, shall we say, restrainer of youthful indulgence. The arrangement was mutually beneficial to both men, as Tycho had a guide through the world and someone who would hold him accountable to the tasks at hand, while Vedder got to continue his university-level studies and make additional contacts. Saxony was chosen due to the numerous contacts the Brahes and the Oxes had with the noble families there, as well as its status as the birthplace of Lutheranism. Leipzig was similar in educational philosophy and curriculum to Copenhagen, thus making the transition easier as well. While there were a number of things Vetter was supposed to make sure Tycho was doing while in Leipzig, including learning defense, speak high German, understand the principles of Renaissance architecture, music, and art, and study military science and political theory, there was no room for astronomy or abstract mathematics. Tycho, however, was not one to let the formal arrangement overseen by his preceptor stop him. He would later write that during this time, he secretly bought and studied astronomical texts and maps of the constellations. Additionally, while Vetter slept, he would measure the motions of the planets, using little more than a piece of string and a small globe of the celestial sphere that he owned. As current as his methods were, and let's be clear, they amounted to little more than holding a string at arm's length and measuring the distances from a given planet to various stars, Tycho soon reinforced his experience with the lunar eclipse. The Alphonsan and Prutenic tables just weren't as accurate in predicting the motions of the planets as he thought they should be. It was at this point that the now 16-year-old Danish aristocrat started keeping scientific records of his observations in a logbook. With the first observation of Mars and then the relatively rare conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. And it should be noted, this is really a big step. This is a, a real break with what someone else might have done in this case. Soon, Vetter's attempts to keep Tycho on task were circumvented as the nobleman found a more advanced student, Bartholomew Schultz, to teach him more of the intricacies of the subject and introduce him to the technical aspects of measurement. This soon prompted Tycho to acquire his first real instrument, the cross staff we mentioned in the previous episode. On May 1st, 1564, he made his first measurement with the tool and that was recorded in the logbook as well. Before long, Tycho was pushing the observational accuracy of the cross staff and discovering its limitations through all-night observing sessions conducted while Vetter slept. Schultz showed him how to refine his measurement using something called transversal points and then correction tables. These were the only options available since, as Brahe later recorded in his writings, quote, he had no opportunity of having new instruments made since my governor, who held the purse strings, would not allow me things of this kind to be made for me. End quote. What we see here is that Tycho is starting down the path that will dominate much of the rest of his life. More than anyone of his time or before him, he's becoming seriously concerned with not only the accuracy, but the precision of the instruments being used to make astronomical observations. It was also during this time that we see him take on a serious observing project for the first time. In the mid-1500s, one of the popular ideas was that the alignments of the heavens, most notably the planets, during the period between Christmas Day and Epiphany, known popularly as the 12 days of Christmas, would forecast the weather for the next 12 months. Tycho set out to see if this was, in fact, true by measuring the positions of everything he could think of and then checking to see if there were any meteorological or astronomical correlations in the data. Before we move on, I'd like to pause here for a moment to consider what an odd thing this must have been for the traditional person in the groups Tycho hung around with. For most, the 12 days of Christmas was sort of a last blowout before the deprivations of winter really set in. As such, there was a lot of revelry and carrying on punctuated by periods of serious religious contemplation and consideration. In the midst of all of this was this broad-shouldered, sort of becoming barrel-chested, vigorous young man with red hair and a large mustache who stayed up all night with a few friends measuring the heavens and talking about the world. 
while such things wouldn't have been so out of place for, say, the son of a member of Leipzig's faculty or perhaps maybe even an enterprising monastic. The presence of a nobleman and his friends on the roof of one of the towers of a local keeper fortress would have been pretty out of place. We'll soon return to what might have driven Tycho to such a set of activities and why he would have felt he was engaging in an endeavor worthy of his noble heritage and upbringing, even if most of those in his class would have disagreed. In May of 1565, as the weather allowed, Brahe and Vetter returned to Denmark. Along the journey, Tycho took latitude measurements at each stop until he reached the ancestral home of Nutstrupsborg and was reunited with his birth parents. A month later, Tycho's uncle and foster father Jorgen died. He and the king had been drinking and the king had fallen into the harbor in Copenhagen while trying to inspect the fleet. Jorgen dove in to save the king, a task he accomplished, but either died during the rescue or shortly after of injuries or illness as a result of the incident. King Frederick would not forget this service on his behalf and would factor into his later support of Tycho in a number of ways. While Tycho should have inherited his uncle's property, the necessary paperwork had not been completed and so the estate was split more generally. It did, however, provide enough wealth for Tycho to continue with his travels, however, and so, a year later, he set out for Wittenberg, where Videl was now studying for a Master of Arts. Five months into his stay, a plague epidemic struck the region and the university was mostly closed. Tycho decided to travel back north to Rostock to take up studies there. This was to be a place of misfortune on a number of counts. The first was that Tycho observed another eclipse of the moon on October 28th that moved him to cast sort of an astrological prediction or horoscope about great events in Europe. In it, he had suggested that the eclipse predicted the death of a great ruler and said it would be Suleiman the Great of Turkey. Composing a poem in the most dramatic of Latin traditions, Tycho announced that Suleiman would not survive the year. Then came the news that the Sultan had already been dead for six months by the time of the eclipse. As you can imagine, there was more than a bit of fun made at Tycho's expense, a good bit of it by Tycho's third cousin, one Mandarup Parsberg. Things deteriorated between the two after that until on December 10th at a betrothal celebration, they began a more serious dispute, one that was continued at another party on December 27th and again on December 29th. On this last occasion, the two ended up demanding the other draw his sword, the 16th century equivalent of, hey, let's take this outside. Before cooler and more sober heads could prevail, the two had begun a duel, and Parsberg's broadsword had taken off most of Tycho's nose. Fortunately, Brahe avoided having the wound become infected, and so survived the encounter. As a result, he would acquire two additional lifelong interests, medicine and alchemy the latter to concoct suitable materials from which to fashion prosthetic noses and adhesives with which to bond them to the remaining bone and scar tissue. In time, he'd become pretty successful at both. In 1567, Tycho left Denmark one more time over the strenuous objections of his father. By this point, the younger Brahe was of the age when he would be expected to take a more active and muscular role in Danish political life especially as the now three-year-old war with Sweden was providing an opportunity for a whole new generation of men to make their names. In many accounts, especially those that are fictional, there's this sort of, um, how shall we say, aggrandizement of the life of the noble people, that they had all the freedom in the world, something that was not available to those beneath their station. But the truth of it is that for the life of a nobleman, there were only a limited number of paths available to one of the aristocratic class, and none of them involved university life Tycho seemed to so enjoy. His continued refusal to set forth either as a knight in the service of the king, an administrator of a fiefdom, or a civil servant in the government was a source of embarrassment and frustration for his family. In other words, 
you know, he wasn't doing what he was expected to do. At least that was until a sort of holding place was found for him until it was hoped he could come to his senses. The position was one similar to that which had been held by Copernicus, a canonry. It was a position that could be held by either commoners or noblemen and had both administrative and scholarly roles and it carried with it an income collected from landed endowments, i.e. rents paid by the tenants using the land given to the old church cathedrals back when they had been Catholic. Since they were now Lutheran, a canon no longer had to take monastic vows or live at the church to help with the performing of daily masses, and so a nobleman of Tycho's rank could hold the position and still study the astronomy he was increasingly giving himself over to. In 1568, it was arranged that Tycho would receive the next open position at the Roskilde Cathedral. Over the next year or so, Tycho traveled from place to place, making friends and developing a network of scholars while studying not only astronomy, but medicine and alchemy as well. He made stops in again Rostock, Arnstadt, Basel on the border of Switzerland, and Freiburg. In due time, he realized that over the course of the previous nine years, he had pretty much learned everything he could from the professors at various universities. If he were to continue on this scholarly path, he would have to begin to work independently. This would specifically take its course in the design and construction of instruments. By this time, he had come to the belief that what was holding astronomy and astrology back from making further progress was not so much an inadequacy of the models, but rather a lack of precision in the instruments that were used to make the observations required to establish the parameters of those models. In 1569, he landed in the imperial city of Augsburg and found it to be very much to his liking. Not only was it particularly congenial, it also possessed craftsmen of reasonably high skill and curiosity. Thus, he was to stay for the next 14 months, creating new instruments of high precision, beginning with his pair of compasses. Even as he worked to design and direct the craftsmen in construction, he began to recognize the limitations even these new instruments possessed due to their size. Fortunately, it was at this point that Tycho met a wealthy alderman of the city, Paul Hainzel, whose brother had been a fellow student with Petter Ox. In the small world of family connections, this brought the two close together and Hainzel agreed to underwrite Brahe's instrument construction projects. Together, they worked to create the Great Quadrant, the largest instrument Tycho would ever design for installation on the grounds of Hansel's estate just outside the city. While it was a successful project, the instrument was so big that it required the work of several servants to operate. These servants, already from a, tired from a day of work on the estate, could not be expected to make more than one set of observations, no matter how energetic Tycho the astronomer might have been. Fortunately, while the quadrant was too cumbersome to be of much practical use, it was a great public relations tool. It soon attracted a good bit of attention for Brahe from the academic elite of the region, not the least of whom was the iconoclastic philosopher Petrus Ramus, who visited in April of 1570. Ramus wanted to deconstruct astronomy by getting rid of all of the competing mo models and rebuild it solely on the basis of observations. Tycho, on the other hand, agreed that the Aristotelian ideas of physics were not unchangeable truth, as was the case with Holy Scripture, but he did point out that the ideas of a geometric cosmos were based on observational evidence rather than being sort of conjured out of thin air. While the two men might have disagreed on the particulars, they were in agreement that much better observations and instruments to make them were needed. Moreover, it may have been Ramus who planted in Tycho's mind a set of ideas regarding his role in a new aristocracy that would soon crystallize with what was perhaps his single most consequential observation. Not too long after this, however, a message arrived that Otto Brahe, Tycho's father, had called all of his sons back home. His health was declining and he wanted to gather his family around him, both to see that his inheritance was handled correctly and in accordance with his wishes, and to ensure his family's continued influence at court. In May of 1571, the elder Brahe died, and Tycho inherited the Nutstropsborg estate along with his brother Stein. The two would jointly share in the income of the 200 farms and associated cottages, mills, and manors. This made Tycho more financially independent and would allow him to follow his path once he had seen to the care of his mother. 
This involved getting her settled into the estate, and it was during this time that Tycho learned that he had been a twin. His sibling, a brother, had died at birth. The revelation of the secret, kept from him for 25 years, affected him profoundly. And in response, he wrote a touching poem in Latin, modeled on the work of Ovid, from the perspective of the dead child who looked with pity from Olympus on the travails of Tycho who dwelt on earth. So important was this expression of devotion to his dead brother that he included it in the first work he ever published. At this point, Tycho is back in Denmark and involved in the affairs of his family. He is not, however, a typical member of his social class. He's a scholar and an intellectual amongst warriors and administrators. While he ha now has at least partial ownership of some family land, his place in the hierarchy has not been recognized with the gift of a royal fife or any real responsibility. This is not to say, though, that Tycho much cared. He was receiving enough income to cover his expenses, his brothers were taking the usual course up through the expected ranks of the aristocratic progression to continue the prestige of the family name, and he had been granted an eventual ceremonial position in the canonry that somewhat recognized his status. All in all, from his perspective, things weren't too bad. The only difficulty was that he had no place to continue his astronomical and alchemical research. However, he soon hit upon a possible solution. His mother's brother, Sten Bele, oversaw an abbey not far from Neustrasburg called Herevat. The abbey had once housed an active cloister of Cistercians, a few of which still lived on in their elder years at the place. After the conversion to Lutheranism, the Billes had acquired the property and ran it as an estate. Given its location and facilities, it had promise for taking on a more scientific mission. Sten Bille, while a traditional aristocrat, was kind, gentle, and the type of man who was at ease with all members of all different social classes. He seemed to understand that each person under his care had an important role and place in the functioning of a well-ordered society, and so he acknowledged people's contributions without hesitation. This extended to commoners and scholars especially. It seems that he saw that his nephew was at something of a crossroads in his life, and so reached out to the young man with an offer. Come to Haravad, he said, and let's see if we can build something where you can do the work you love. You'll be close to your mother, and you'll have things you need to do your work. Tycho, seeing this as a way to take another step away from that traditional path without having to leave it completely, took his uncle up on the offer. With Sten's support, both intellectual and financial, and his own resources, Tycho set out to create a research facility at the Abbey. Nowadays, such an enterprise seems pretty unremarkable, but it should be understood that nothing, and I mean nothing of this sort, had ever been done in Denmark not even at the University of Copenhagen. In fact, one could even say, really, nothing of this sort had ever been done in Europe, at least since, you know, they came out of the Dark Ages. Yes, there had been some small research operations, but nothing that marshaled the amount and kind of resources that not only supported what amounted to a working scholar and his assistant, but also a staff of craftsmen and laborers to assist with the making, maintaining, and working with instruments not only astronomical, but alchemical as well. The plans for the facility on the grounds included an observatory, an alchemical laboratory, and a paper mill. To this would be eventually added a printing press. These operations brought together glassmakers, woodworkers, metalsmiths, and their assistants. In one case, Tycho was able to snag a Venetian glassmaker, Antonio de Castillo Veneziano, who was likely on the run from the government of Venice, who were really not very happy that one of their masters had decided to, quote-unquote, take his talents to another place not under their authority and control. Not only would de Castillo and his assistants produce the glassware for the laboratory, but he would also make stemware and window panes for the royal family. 
It was here that Tycho built his sextant and in the process learned of his need to have expert craftsmen working in his own shop if the instruments were ever to reach his stated goal of one arc minute of precision. While Haravad was a good start, though, it wasn't perfect. Its remoteness made certain things difficult, and due to the fact that it had been constructed for an entirely different purpose, there were always limitations and compromises to be made regarding the work done. Nevertheless, in the project, Tycho began to recognize what sorts of things a truly world-class research facility designed from the ground up would need to have. It was also in this time that a vision of something grander would begin to form in his mind. As 1571 turned into 1572, this wasn't the only thing stirring in Tycho. He likely first saw her while attending services in a small church near Nutstraborg and Kagerod. The pastor's daughter, she would have been dressed simply and modesty. Her father had likely baptized Tycho and buried his twin and had served as the congregation's leader until his death in 1569. We don't know what began their relationship, but by 1572 it was clear that Tycho wanted to spend his life with this woman who was more than a peasant girl, but less than either a scholar or an aristocrat. And it is here that we see Tycho take just another step off of the path so clearly laid out for him. Perhaps it was the generous attitude of his uncle and the way he treated those not of his station. Maybe it was that time he spent in the house of a clergyman while at school in Copenhagen. Maybe it was the, the experience of working with Hainzel's servants on the estate outside of Augsburg. Whatever it was, it was clear that Tycho did not feel himself bound or constrained by the strictures of his class. In the aristocratic classes throughout history, there is almost always a rule, sometimes unspoken, but more often codified in law. You don't go outside of your class for the important things in life, most especially marriage. While we tend to conceptualize marriage as an expression of love and devotion, for most of history it has been a way of passing along property and possessions from one generation to the other without inciting strife and bloodshed. More cynically, it has also been a way to keep power concentrated in the hands of a few. Because of this, it was usually the case that marriages were business arrangements, and those affairs of the hearts, or at least lustful liaisons, were conducted within, well, extramarital affairs. For a youth of Tycho's day, a young man distracting himself with the flings with commoners' daughters was understood as somewhat normative, but it was never thought appropriate for those trysts to become anything more. However, it was understood that there were those times when the heart wanted what the heart wanted, and powerful men would desire for a lifelong companion in a woman not of their station. While such practices were becoming increasingly frowned upon and made more legally dubious in Tycho's day, there was a route wherein a nobleman could take a commoner wife and not create problems of inheritance. Known as morganatic marriage, the man and woman could live together, openly, as husband and wife, and after three years, they would be considered married, and the woman would be allowed to wear on her belt the keys to her husband's manse. However, both partners would retain their separate statuses under the law, and all children of the union would be considered commoners. And so this is how Tycho Brahe and Kirsten Jorgen's daughter came to be married. With this also came the taint of scandal. Tycho was, once again, flouting convention, and not all of his family was very happy about it. He was the eldest of the Brahe boys, and it was expected that he would carry on the line through marrying a proper aristocratic woman and siring sons to carry the name. However, he did receive support, and it came from the most unexpected of sources, King Frederick II himself. The king had not forgotten the debt of his life that he owed to the action of, of Tycho's uncle. Moreover, Frederick, too, had once fallen for a woman beneath his station and had desired to enter into a relationship similar to the one Tycho now had begun. He understood the needs of the heart, and though he eventually had to be persuaded, or perhaps coerced is a better word, to set aside the love affair, he knew the pain the decision had caused. He understood the particular cost here of belonging to his class. 
Frederick's marriage to his cousin, the Princess Sophie of Mecklenburg, took place in that same year of 1572, and in his regret of having to set aside the woman he truly loved for the needs of the state, Frederick did not apply any pressure for Tycho to do the same. One note is in order here. In some accounts of Tycho's life that will get read in various not scholarly sources, it is said that he married a peasant girl or that he kept something of a concubine. Neither of these things could be further from the truth. Why Kirsten Jorgen's daughter was not part of the aristocratic class, she was the daughter of a learned man. In Germany, this would have included her in the burgher class of municipal leaders. She likely would have been reasonably well educated and cultured. While she would not have been allowed to attend court functions with her husband, it is clear from the accounts of Tycho's later students and his assistants that she occupied a full and honored place in his household. During the years around the beginning of their marriage, he often traveled without her for various reasons, but this too was not uncommon among the younger members of the aristocracy, who were often required to travel without their families on missions for the crown to prove their worth before being handed more settled estates to manage. It is clear then that Tycho's marriage, while certainly the stuff of court scandal and gossip, was not some kind of illicit affair. Rather, it was a proper marriage made legal through fairly torturous and arcane processes that were required by increasingly strict class laws. In 1572, the other great event of Tycho's life was the appearance in November of the new star in the constellation of Cassiopeia. As we've already discussed the scientific aspects of this event in our previous episode, let me focus on a few other aspects of the discovery and the accompanying publications. First, this was a huge boost to Tycho's new path. The ever-widening split between his journey and those of his peers was threatening to swamp his ambitions. However, with the announcements regarding the star and the refutation of the Aristotelian view of an unalterable celestial realm, Tycho's fame skyrocketed. However, it was not only Tycho's fame, it was also that of Denmark as a whole, something not lost on Frederick. The king had been a vigorous supporter of scholarly activity in his realm, increasing the already generous endowment for the University of Copenhagen substantially. Tycho's first book, De Stella Nova, and the subsequent publication of his observational data related to that discovery, showed Denmark not as some sort of Germanic cultural backwater, but rather a place where greater discoveries were being made than those older institutions in Italy and southern Germany. This rise in Danish prestige on the world stage brought about by Tycho's work was not in any way, shape, or form lost on the king. Second, and we've been hinting at this for the entire episode, in the supplementary material for the book, we get a deep insight into Tycho's emerging worldview. Along with the poem related to his dead twin, Tycho had also included another relating the vision given to him from the Greek muse Urania. In this poem, we can see the influence of the emerging Neoplatonist and Epicurean philosophies on the values Tycho holds most dear. Values that have been pulling him away from the aristocracy of his birth towards an intellectual aristocracy founded on the ideals of amicticia and scholarship. As a note, in this discussion, I'll be drawing heavily from John Robert Christensen's brilliant work on Tycho titled, On Tycho's Island. For those who would like to learn more about the social and cultural forces of this period of European history, as well as the lives of a number of lesser known but tremendously influential intellectual figures, I heartily recommend this work. Amicticia is the idea of friendship that has its origins in a dialogue written by the Roman statesman Cicero. Rooted in the Greek word eros, it held within it connotations first expressed by the philosopher Empedocles, who said that change in the world was driven by love, eros, and strife. 
the former being what brought things together. In Latin, this had been translated to amor, which, in the context of relationships of a non-romantic sort, had become amicticia. Thus, by the time of Tycho, with the reintroduction of Greek philosophical ideas, there was a school of thought that said, in order to fully understand what drove the creation, one had to pursue this amicticia. In the poem, written for his friend Johannes Pretensis, Tycho expresses that, quote, friendship communicating through nature, end quote, is necessary to both bring friends together and bring a fuller spiritual experience to one's life. In the poem, Tycho would write, quote, We cannot join our beaming eyes because we live so far apart, and yet the beams of radiant Olympus join our eyes at last. For every time the starry flock does graze the heavens at night, then every star I see with eyes turned heavenward, that very star your eyes will see. So heaven itself unites our eyes, and earth releases to our heavy flesh. End quote. This friendship is expressed in the mutual giving and receiving of gifts, each tying the friends closer together in reciprocity, not unlike the patron-client relationships between Lord and Vassal. However, in the Amicticia relationship, there is an equality lacking from the other, a coming together of the mind and spirit that Tycho must have found deeply appealing after the tumultuous aristocratic upbringing he would have experienced, with its unending rules and formalities. In the prefatory material to De Stella Nova, two friends write poems dedicated to Tycho, while the letters with another serve to introduce the subject matter. Herein we see this interplay of gift and gratitude that so marked these types of relationships. It is clear that Tycho saw himself as part of a college of equals, all united in a friendship devoting to seeking out and discovering the great mysteries of nature. In this, Tycho, through his observations of the new star, has struck a great blow and uncovered an unparalleled revelation. So great was this sense that he ends the book with a poem modeled on Ovid's Epiphany that equates the discovery and observation of the new star with a visitation by the muse of astronomy, Urania. The words that opened our episode come from this elegy to Urania, and in them we can see Brahe's dedication to the idea of amicticia and his disdain for those who are bereft of its blessings. In the elegy, Brahe will write of his initial encounter with the star, represented by the words of the muse to him. Quote, but soon you fell to Vulcan's secret arts, and labored many hours with sacred fire. My glory dimmed, for no one worshipped me, and I was stripped of honor as before. But I could bear it, since the earth has stars, and are not at enmity with mine. The earth has suns, and its moons as well. It takes its hosts of stars in broad embrace. For that which is above is also hid below, and those two reasons have a common nature. But earthly stars are treated just like matter. The powers they have appeared in Vulcan's art. Our stars in heaven's sphere the eye can see, but in mind alone, not eyes, can see their force. Later in the poem, Brahe continues. Like blind moles, lethargic mobs see no more than earthly, perishable things. So very few Apollo grants to see the riches which Olympus hides away. For they must show contempt for earthly gain, and lift their eyes to heavenly beams. And Venus cannot lure them, not the glass of wanton Bacchus, riches, power, fame. More beautiful by far the goal they seek, for it is not a goal unknown to the gods. Through mental force, control the heaven stars, subject the ether to his conjuring spirit. End quote. Here we see that for Tycho and his intellectual companions, 
The true pursuit in friendship is to understand the depths of nature, and in doing so, within that framework, the practitioners will begin to drive the forces that affect all the universe. Given this, it is not surprising that Tycho writes of his own calling to serve the muse. Quote, But I recall an ancient, worthy time, when I was worshipped, honored here on earth, and I recall when in the halls of kings proudly I went forth in glory. Then no men but kings and those of royal blood would dare approach my sacred temple site. But you do not neglect to show me honor, for you have strewn your incense upon my altar and often stand at night and watch the stars. Then spoke Apollo, he belongs to you. His very words, and both of us did hope that you would dedicate yourself to me and serve me under Ursa Major's sign and spread abroad your northern homeland's fame. End quote. It is here, in these words, that I think we can see the guiding principles that would form the rest of Tycho's life in many regards. With the publication of De Stella Nova, Tycho became famous, and soon he hit upon the idea of presenting a series of lectures at Copenhagen. While completely within the ethos of Amicticia to share his discoveries and successes with his friends and colleagues there, the whole idea was way outside the social rules for a nobleman to give lectures and participate in the everyday activities of commoners. It was one of those things that frustrated Tycho to no end and was, as is usually the case for him, there was a way found to allow him the honor. A number of the students of the university were sons of noblemen and they signed a petition to have one of their own instruct them in the meaning of this new star and other manners pertaining to it. As all lectures were at the university were open, anyone else who chose to attend could do so, and so a solution was found. Given in 1574, the lectures discussed his work and his views on astrology, which took a middle road between those who thought that the stars determined the lives of people on earth and others who felt astrology was foolishness. Tycho lectured that the stars did exert influences on human beings and their behaviors, but also that free will could and often did overcome these influences. As he put it, quote, there is something in man that has been raised above the stars, end quote. With this, he encouraged support of education, discipline, and virtue in order for those who wish to achieve good fortune in life to rise above the brutish tendencies and forces of creation. The lectures were a rousing success and further cemented Tycho's reputation. As a result, Frederick sent Tycho on another tour of Europe in 1575. This time, Tycho was to recruit workers and craftsmen from among the best Europe had to offer to come to Copenhagen and work for the king on his projects there. While very successful in this mission, Tycho had begun to entertain the idea that as good as Heverod was, there was really not a place in Denmark for him. There was no true scholarly community, and he would always be surrounded by the intrigues of court life that increasingly bored and frustrated him. To be sure, he was tired of the banal chatter of women bedded, battles fought, and quantities of alcohol consumed that seemed to occupy the fraternity house-like atmosphere the other young men at court seemed to embrace. As he despaired of a life there, one in which his wife and children would never have a place, he began contemplating leaving Denmark altogether. In secret, he began to negotiate with the University of Basel for a position of some sort there. In December of 1575, Tycho paid his regards at the court of the king, and for the first time, it seems, Frederick really got to take his measure of the nephew of the man who had saved his life. At this point, Tycho, now 29, was strong, barrel-chested, and regal. He was the consummate courtier, having represented Frederick in courts all over Europe. He was well-spoken, even better regarded, and extraordinarily intelligent but he was also something of an outsider. So while he could fit in with the court at Sorrow Abbey celebrating Christmas, it was pretty obvious that he found little satisfaction in it. 
Word had come from Wilhelm IV of Kassel's court that the land grave there had interest in both astronomy and Tycho and was likely looking for a way to lure him out of Denmark for good. While Frederick didn't know of Tycho's negotiations with Basil, he could read between the lines of the man's reports to see that there were a lot of universities near the courts he had visited. And so, as the festivities wound down, Frederick offered Tycho one of any number of fiefs, and to his surprise, Tycho refused them all. The king, smart enough to know when to push and when not to, advised Tycho to take some time to think the offer over. As the two men parted, Frederick began to realize that the usual aristocratic motivations held only limited value for Tycho. Perhaps it was in a conversation with Sten Bille about the work at Herovod that the king began to glimpse the real motivations. Maybe he read the elegy to Urania in some detail. Whatever the cause, Frederick soon had a new idea and sent for Tycho on February 11th of 1576. In a surprise move, he offered Tycho the island of Haven, along with the income from other properties in order to build a research facility like the one at Herovod, but better, designed from the ground up for the purpose of continuing the work. This was a huge, huge break with tradition. Kings granted aristocrats fiefs and incomes so that the aristocrats could help the king keep the kingdom safe and administered effectively. Frederick now, however, was offering a fife not for the purpose of defense, but the purpose of scientific research. Not since Alexandria had the state been so inclined to support such pursuits. For Tycho's part, he was at first hesitant. How did such a thing fit into Amicticia? And so he wrote to two of his friends to get their input. Both were hugely enthusiastic. Tycho would be able to construct his temple and mu museum to Urania, finally. And so on February 18th, he accepted the royal offer and four days later boarded a boat that would take him across the icy waters to the island where he would spend the next two decades of his life. That evening, he would make his first observations from the island, viewing a conjunction of the moon and Mars in the foot of the constellation of Orion. Six months later, on August 8th, as the Sun and Jupiter were rising in the constellation of Leo, a cornerstone for the new observatory was laid. A gift from his friends, it symbolized that the foundation of the work to be done on the island was this idea of Amicticia. At this point, with Tycho stepping onto the island of Aven, we'll bring our episode to a close. Next week, we'll really dig into Tycho's work on the island and then the factors that led to his exile and eventual rehabilitation in the court of Prague. As always, thanks for listening. If you have some time, please leave us a review on whatever service you listen to the show with. And if you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe so you can get the latest episodes as soon as they're released. If you'd like to contact us or know about the, more about the podcast, you can join our Facebook group by searching on The Scientific Odyssey or by following me at Twitter at, at Chad Davies. Our sources for this episode and the next have been the aforementioned on Tycho's Island and Kitty Ferguson's fine biographical work, Tycho and Kepler, the unlikely partnership that forever changed our understanding of the heavens. Also, it should be noted, the definitive work on the life of Tycho is Victor Thorin's The Lord of Uraniborg. Finally, thanks to the Blue Dot Sessions for letting us use their fantastic compositions. You can find out more about their work at their website, sessions.blue. So until next time, full sails on your journey.